Greetings there, academic proletariat, and welcome to this episode of the Fireside Chats with Mr. Olson, where we will be discussing period eight. If you are feeling like Richard Nixon in the photograph in the background of this PowerPoint, it's because we are almost done, people. One period to go. Although, I think Richard Nixon could use a makeover. There we go. Much better. He's much more handsome looking now. All right, let's go ahead and remind you that period eight has a guided notes that go along with it. It looks a bit, bit like this for you to take notes while listening to this video. All right. Period 8 can be periodized, or it's a period. Starts with the end of World War II and the beginning of the Cold War, which sort of go together, which we'll discuss. And it ends with the election of Ronald Reagan and the conservative tide in American politics that is full-fledged by 1980. Okay, here are Period 8's key concepts. If you want to internalize them and pause me right now, you can. Otherwise, since we're going to read through them one by one, We'll go ahead and uh, move right along. So period eight starts with key concept 8.1, which says the United States responded to an uncertain and unstable post-war world by asserting and working to maintain a position of global leadership with far-reaching domestic and international consequences. If rewritten, this key concept kind of reminds me of something to the tune of the United States was afraid of communism, so it tried to kill it. Sort of like if you've ever seen a certain demographic trying to kill a spider but failing the spider lives and the fear goes on that's sort of how america approached communism during uh the post-war era sorry i didn't give you a chance to rewrite key concept 8.1 in your own words but you can use mine I'll take it. Okay, so key concept 8.1, Roman numeral run. The United States policymakers engaged in a Cold War with the authoritarian Soviet Union, seeking to limit the growth of communist military power and ideological influence, create a free market global economy, and build an international security system. So we're going to go ahead and start by talking about the origins of the Cold War. Now, the Cold War doesn't have a definitive start date. Uh, historians kind of go back and forth about this. Some say it happened at Yalta when FDR met with Churchill and Stalin to talk about what post-war Germany was going to look like. Stalin promised free elections in Poland, didn't fall, follow through on them, so there needed to be another conference at Potsdam in 1945 where Stalin still does not follow through on stuff, but Stalin catches wind of the American atomic bomb that uh, was just successfully tested, and when Truman doesn't say anything to him, Stalin gets mad. Anyways, that atomic bomb bombing of Japan, which happens in August 1945, uh, done, according to many, to intimidate the Soviets, really starts the beginning of what we would think of as a Cold War. Not only does it formally end the war, but... It sort of creates this dissonance between the great powers. Now, uh, one of the most definitive uh, beginning parts of the Cold War uh, is brought on by George Kennan's long telegram, which is sent in 1946. Kennan was an, ambas an ambassador in the Kremlin, uh, which means that he was sort of a liaison between the American and the Soviet governments, and he sends a, a letter to America that says the Soviets are crazy, America needs to stop them because they will never, ever be nice. They're certifiably insane. Now, this sort of indicates that America has to do something about communism, which is going to dictate policy for the next roughly 45 years. So the different periods of Cold War policy can be broken down as illustrated on the slide. Uh, the most important is containment, hence the reason it's bolded and underlined, because containment is sort of the underlying policy throughout this entire period. It's how America starts to combat communism, and it's sort of uh, an ideological drive the entire time. Okay, next we have brinkmanship, flexible response, detente, and then finally rollback, which is the policy seen at the end of the Cold War. Okay, so let's talk about containment first. Containment initially is seen through events like the Truman Doctrine, where uh, America pledges money to Greece and Turkey to help uh, um, avert communism there. The Marshall Plan, indicated by the map to the right, which shows that America gave a lot of money to Western European countries in order to pre prevent communism from spreading there. And then finally, the Berlin Airlift, which was the result of Stalin closing off Allied access to Berlin and uh, Americans dropping supplies from the sky uh, to allow the people in West Berlin to live. So th those are examples of containment. But like I said, containment is something that is seen throughout the entire period. Now, brinkmanship, which was uh, Dwight Eisenhower's approach to the Cold War, was predicated on the idea that if the Soviets, who had recently developed their own atomic bomb, did something stupid, America should be prepared to counteract any stupid action by the Soviet Union by having enough bombs of their own. So this idea is called mutually assured destruction, and it basically means that if one country uses a bomb, another one's going to use a bomb, and then both sides will be destroyed. So it's kind of like 
intimidating each other not to do sound something stupid. This leads to what Eisenhower calls the military industrial complex, which is basically a close tie between military tech technology industries and the government. So the government is basically going to facilitate a military economy. Now, a policy paper, NSC 68, which uh, lays out this whole deal, basically urges America to build up its military. And as you can see, NSC 68 is published in early 1950 as a response to the Soviets getting their own bomb. And as you can see by the chart on the right, uh, there are several increases after 1950. Now, note that there are significant increases right after 1950 because of the Soviet dropping their atomic bomb, and right um, in about 1953 because of the Korean War. So you can, you can see tremendous increases, and it's important to be able to contextualize those. Okay, the next Cold War policy was Kennedy's called flexible response, and this is basically we're going to um, mold a response to Soviet action based on the situation we're facing. Here are some examples of flexible response. The Bay of Pigs invasion in which Americans tried to oust Fidel Castro's communist government in Cuba in 1961, which of course fails because of the full moon. The Cuban Missile Crisis in which Kennedy um, puts a blockade around Cuba to try and deter the Russians from putting nuclear-tipped missiles in Cuba. And then finally, the space race, which isn't anything violent, but it does create a lot of angst in America, especially with the Russians sending Sputnik up into outer space, basically makes Americans think that, oh my gosh, they, they could blow us up. But anyways, you know about the space race and America wanting to get to the moon first, and that's sort of an outgrowth of Kennedy's flexible response. If we can prove that we're better than the Russians, we should do so. Now, uh, even though Kennedy was trying to be flexible, there's some examples of inflexible response, which, uh, just to remind my viewers, this video is kind of uh, lax on these topics. However, um, you can find them at length in your book, which I'm sure you have been assigned to read by your teacher. So examples of inflexible response. First of all, the Korean War, where Americans engaged North Korea to try and prevent the spread of communism to South Korea, um, which ended in a stalemate, as you can see from the map to the right. Um, basically, the same line that had been uh, established before the war was established after the war, and uh, Korea re remains just as divided today as it was then. The other and more influential in American policy and American life is the Vietnam War, which of course occurs for a long period of time in the 1960s and 1970s, and uh, it becomes one of our longest conflicts and, of course, the one that we do not win. Uh, the Vietnam War is brought on by the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which was basically Congress giving the president a blank check to escalate the war where he saw fit, and President Johnson escalated that war. And he told all Americans that things were going well for a while, and then all of a sudden, in early 1968, the Vietnamese mount a huge offensive against Americans called the Tet Offensive, and uh, it showed people at home that the war wasn't really going that that well. And it sort of unveiled a lot of government lying and a lot of government corruption with regard to Vietnam. Okay, war over. Back to Richard Nixon's policy, detente, which basically means to thaw tensions between the Soviets and the Americans. Uh, Nixon goes through, through this in a number of ways. He visits China, he visits the Soviet Union, and he tries to turn the Vietnam War over to the Vietnamese. And basically, let's fo focus on the first two. Um, he visits China and he visits the Soviet Union in, a, in an effort to sort of play them against each other, indicated by the cartoon to the right. Nixon is a master at foreign policy, and uh, he's very, very patient, which allows him to sort of uh, play these two powers off against one another because they're worrying what is Nixon doing when he's in the other country. Okay, so that's detente. And then finally, detente uh, illustrates that it doesn't work in 1979 when the Soviets invade Afghanistan, and that's right before Ronald Reagan comes to power, and Reagan promises aggressive action and aggressive policy towards the Soviets and apparently some funny faces to get them to relent and to get them to back down. He's going to be the topic of uh, period nine, so we're going to go ahead and skip him. All right, key concept 8.1, Roman numeral two. Cold War policies led to public debates over the power of the federal government and acceptable means for pursuing international and domestic goals while protecting civil liberties. So we're talking civil uh, rights movement. Um, not yet, but soon. Okay, so uh, this is ideological things related to the Cold War, and everything basically stems from America's fear of communism. So between 
communists infiltrating the State Department, as illustrated by Joseph McCarthy and uh, his list of communists and the subsequent Red Scare that it, he provokes, the fear of spies like Alger Hiss and the Rosenbergs, uh, who are um, executed for their association with giving the Soviet secrets. All these things sort of lead to a um, uh, the mindset of of fear and panic amongst Americans. And this is where we see duck and cover come in place. And anyways, communism has profound impacts on American thought. Now, uh, the war in Vietnam also has a influential impact on American thought, especially through the emergence of the counterculture and war protests that seriously divides Americans. You start to see the silent majority emerge as being the voice of reason and the voice of pa patriotism, and you see the counterculture emerge as the voice uh, against the war. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the civil rights movement. Key concept 8.2, new movements for civil rights and li liberal efforts to expand the role of the government generated a range of political and cultural responses. Go ahead and answer uh, key concept 8.2 in your own words. My own words came out to something like this. People who were sick of getting stepped on started fighting back. So let's talk about those, those groups. Key Concept 8.2, Roman numeral 1. Seeking to fulfill Reconstruction era promises, civil rights activists and political leaders achieved some legal and political successes in ending segregation, although progress towards racial equality was slow. Note, it's given an essay on, Reconstruct or on civil rights, excellent synthesizing point, Reconstruction. Okay, so the origins of the civil rights movement, I want to remind you that slaves resisted People resisted Jim Crow. The Harlem Renaissance was a cultural resistance. The Double V campaign was arguing that why should black Americans fight on behalf of American peace overseas if we can't even get the same equality extended to us at home. So my point here is to remind you that black people had been resisting their oppression for a long time. It's not like Martin Luther King Jr. comes on the scene and all of a sudden all the black people are mad. That's not how it works. Okay, um, There had been resistance for a while. Now, key phases of the civil rights movement and how we're going to organize this discussion. First, they tried to use the courts through a process known as litigation. Then they tried to use civil di disobedience and protest to try and integrate public places, integration. And finally, separation was that period where they were frustrated by the lack of success of the first two, and they tried to use self-defense and militant advocacy um, and autonomy to try and advance their, their rights. So the litigation phase is... Uh, is uh, embodied by two important Supreme Court cases, Shelley versus Kramer, which uh, calls restrictive covenants or rules that don't allow black people to live by white people unconstitutional, lesser known, but still awesome, uh, Supreme Court case, and Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, which overturns Plessy versus Ferguson's separate but equal clause and says uh, that separate accommodations are inherently unequal. Well, this phase didn't get a lot done because southern states resisted Brown versus Board and its ruling by in a in an action called massive resistance. And so we needed to go to something else. So then we get the integration phase, which occurs between 1954 and 1965. So in the integration phase is where we see the more recognizable things like the Montgomery bus boycott set off by Rosa Parks, the Little Rock Nine that has to do with Little Rock Central High School and the integration um, of the nine black students who are uh, allowed to go to school there. Sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina, where uh, black students go sit at segregated lunch counters demanding to be served. They get arrested. So surprise, surprise. Freedom rides on which black and white activists mostly associated with the civil rights organization CORE or the Congress of Racial Equality ride uh, desegregated buses down to Alabama, and uh, one bus iconically gets firebombed. You probably know which picture I'm talking about. And then the March on Washington, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, and finally the televised and publicized marches in Birmingham, Alabama that were so iconically captured in pictures like this where police in Birmingham sicked dogs on the protesters and sprayed the protesters with fire hoses. And all of this culminates in two important federal actions. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, which legally undoes Jim Crow, gets rid of segregation in public places, and the Voting Rights Act in 1965, which legally gets rid of literacy tests, poll taxes, and other things that had been uh, already gotten rid of by the 24th Amendment, but, it's, you know, southern states are kind of slow. Sorry if you're in the south. Okay. Um, and the third phase, separation, is uh, one that we will talk about in a second. 
Key concept 8.2, Roman numeral 2, responding to social conditions and, and the African civil rights movement, a variety of movements emerged that focused on issues of identity, social justice, and the environment. So basically, the civil rights movement sets off a, a bunch of other move, movements. So other groups advocating for civil rights were women, and this movement was set off by Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, a book published in 1963 that argued that housewives really weren't happy, and also the Roe versus Wade case, which allowed women to have rights to privacy and rights over their, their body. Gay Americans fight for their rights after the Stonewall riot in 1969. Latino Americans advocate for their rights behind uh, a labor leader, Cesar Chavez, and urges that uh, Me Mexican and Latino Americans be treated equal in the workplace. And then the most awesome American Indians uh, and the American Indian movement, which takes over Alcatraz. Seriously. Okay, other social problems that come up, uh, the persistence of poverty during the time period. It's, it's evidenced by John Kenneth Galbraith's Affluent Society, a book written in the 1950s, which argues that America is very affluent, but it's not the affluence is not equally distributed, and then the Great Society and its war on poverty, which sort of targets uh, poverty especially, not so successful, but it tried. Uh, and then in addition to poverty, there's, there's also environmental concerns, one illustrated by Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, which discussed pesticides, and then of course the Three Mile Island nuclear disaster in, 19, in the late 1970s, which indicated that Nuclear power was not safe, but it also led Americans to question not only the use of it, but to go back to using oil and other things. Okay, key concept 8.2, liberalism influenced post-war politics and court decisions, but it came under increasing attack from the left as well as from a resurgent conservative movement. Okay, so let's talk about um, liberalism. First of all, I'm going to go back here. The word liberalism is a fluid concept. It basically means how people are given rights or freedom. And the meaning of liberalism changes. So you don't, you don't have to spend too much time wondering what that means. But in the 1960s and the 1970s, liberalism meant that the government was going to make sure that you had enough access to be treated equally. Okay, And liberalism fails because if you've been paying attention to America today, you don't see things are, are equal. Okay, so let's talk about ways that liberalism was tried or attempted to be uh, extended. First was through, through the Great Society, the aforementioned Great Society, which was Lyndon Johnson's attempt to be like FDR and extend more rights to Americans. If synthesizing the Great Society, always go with the New, the new Deal and vice versa. They're very similar. Um, the Great Society did, though, focus more on poverty, illustrated by programs like Medicaid, which is health care to impoverished Americans, Head Start, which is preschool services to impoverished Americans, and food stamp programs, which is like giving poor people food, which is a given, but then also helping out other groups like old people with Medicare and whatnot. Now, we've talked a lot about the Great Society. It was kind of ruined by the Vietnam War and the fact that it was so expensive and conservatives didn't want to pay for it. Now, one of the lesser discussed things, in my class at least, was the rights revolution and the role that the Supreme Court played. So the Supreme Court's uh, rights revolution, which was uh, overseen by the Earl Warren Court, and Earl Warren is the second most important Supreme Court, or chief judge on the Supreme Court, too, Hopefully you just said John Marshall. Anyways, his court oversaw famous cases like Gideon versus Wainwright and Miranda versus Arizona, both of which extended rights to, to criminals. He also oversaw Brown versus Board of Education, and so he was uh, the, the chief judge of the Supreme Court that oversaw a lot of civil rights extensions. Now, his uh, successor, Warren Berger, who was nominated, ironically, by Richard Nixon, oversees Roe versus Wade and Charlotte uh, Mecklenburg School Board uh, and the busing case. And so these are, the Supreme Court played an influential role in extending rights, which is kind of ironic because the Supreme Court had been our most conservative branch of government um, up until, well, it, it is now still probably, I mean, that's debatable, but um, it was definitely not during the 1960s. Now, um, attacks on liber liber liberalism came from two sides. It came from the left and it came from the cu counterculture seen uh, with the rise of groups like the New Left, which were academics, 
uh, that were arguing against American policies and uh, hippies and people that were associated with free love and human beings and Woodstock in 1969. They criticized liber liberalism for its failures. And then liberalism also came under attack from the right or from conservatives like Barry Goldwater, who said that these social programs instituted by the Great Society were just handouts and that handouts don't do anything and the silent majority then uh, voices their displeasure with the liberalism created by the Great Society by voting for Richard Nixon in 1968, which you can see makes him very happy. Uh, now, this period, we, we see a loss of confidence in the government, and this is another point of liberalism failing, and that people really start to question you know, it, the reliability of their government. First is seen in the Vietnam War with its escalation. Uh, this was best evidenced by the Pentagon Papers, which were leaked to the press and showed that the government had been lying to the people for a while about Vietnam. And uh, this is one of the reasons why Richard Nixon is so paranoid, because people are leaking information, which is why he has tapes installed at the White House to, to record all the conversations that occur, which eventually leads to the Watergate conspiracy that occurs in 1972 to 1974. And Watergate is, of course, Richard Nixon cheating in the 1972 election and then trying to cover it up and leads to his resignation. Now, when Gerald Ford pardons Nixon shortly after taking over, the public, uh, there's a public outcry arguing that um, government is not reliable any longer, and so we need some, some sort of change. Okay, it's going to lead us to key concept 8.3. Post-war economic and demographic changes had far-reaching consequences for American society, politics, and culture. If I were to rewrite key concept 8.3, since we're talking about demographics, the demographic changes in this key concept are that people are moving to the suburbs, and that really changed a lot of how uh, Americans live, because the suburbs had an impact on the cities, people moved south and west, it was just people are move, moving all over the place. Okay, key concept 8.3, Roman numeral 1, rapid economic and social changes in American society fostered a sense of optimism in the post-war years. So... Um, this is, uh, gives us a chance to talk about the 1950s and mass consumption or mass consumerism. Examples of mass consumerism would be suburbanization, evidence at the picture to the right of Levitt towns, which were basically cookie-cutter homes built really close together in neighborhoods that middle-class white Americans were allowed to live in. Okay, they, Usually black people weren't allowed to live in them, which is why they were called sundown towns. If you were black, you had to leave when the sun went down. You also see mass consumption with regard to the car and the culture that emerges from the car, uh, like McDonald's and Howard Johnson's and drive-in movie theaters. The car becomes an uh, uh, important mover of public policy. And this is also seen with, in the government with uh, the erection and building of the interstate highway system. Now, mass consumption is also evidenced by the traditional family that starts to get dishwashers and washing machines and TVs and all of this stuff. Uh, the traditional family is best evidenced by Leave it to Beaver, which is, of course, a show where the male is the breadwinner, the wife stays home and wears an apron all day, there's two kids, a white picket fence, a two-story house, and a dog, usually a golden retriever. Now, all of this points to the fact that Americans... Some Americans are very affluent. Now, there were some not-so-traditional family values like the emergence of rock and roll, the beatniks, which were a group of writers that criticized this homogenous mass consumption society. But for the most part, people weren't listening. They were in, living in their mass consumption, and they liked it. Another demographic uh, change is seen with where people live. This, this uh, period in American history sees people, uh, a large amount of uh, moving going on internally. So just like in the Great Depression when people were moving from places like the Dust Bowl to California, places are moving, people are moving from places like the Midwest and the Northeast, which used to be industrial centers, to places in the South and the Southwest, which become known as the Sun Belt, called the Sun Belt because those places are sunny and warm. We also see a change in immigration. Immigrants, instead of coming from uh, Europe, are now coming from Latin America and Asia, which makes sense because places where industrial jobs are available now, like Texas and Arizona and California and Florida, are closer to Latin America, and the West Coast is clo closer to Asia. So that's related to the different waves of immigration that we had. The first wave was Irish and German immigrants during the market revolution. The second wave was immigrants from Southeast Asia during the Gilded Age. And now, uh, during this recent uh, 
uh, influx of immigration. We see them coming uh, from Latin America and Asia. Okay, key concept 8.3, Roman numeral 2. New demographic and social developments, along with anxieties over the Cold War, changed U.S. culture and led to significant political and moral debates that sharply divided the nation. We see the, the group that, and this is the only group I'm going to cover here, called the moral majority. And the moral majority is just like the name sounds. They're a majority of Americans that think that the country's morals are seriously in question. They're led by a group of evangelical Americans and um, iterant preachers like Jerry Falwell, who are upset by the rights given to criminals, who are upset by the rights given uh, to, to minorities, that are upset by the sexual revolution, they're upset by the drugs, they're upset by the Woodstock, and they vote for that. And that is how we are going to start our next unit. That is the end. If you have any questions, you feel free to email me. Otherwise... Peace.